I had an interesting uh, thing happen this week. I was, uh, I'm planning a, a, hopefully we get to play our national titles for touch football. That's coming up in Coffs Harbour in March. And so we've begun the planning process for the over 45s team, which I'm in. And uh, yeah, that's right. Thanks for the whoop. <laughs> nice to get a whoop every now and then. Hopefully we go down there and we don't get whooped. Huh? You like it? That was good. I thought that was pretty good. So we're beginning the planning process of going down there and um, there's a bit of banter going on online be between all the boys, the players, coming from all different sort of parts of the state <coughs> to represent our region. And um, part of the banter is that there's a handful of us who next year we get to play over 50s. Even though next year technically I turn 40... Nine, is it? What do I turn this year? Yeah, I turn 49 this year. Yeah, so next year I turn 50. So next year I can play over 50s. You're shocked. I can tell some of you like, what, 50? Wow, look at him. Oil of you land twice a day. <laughs> My youth is renewed like the eagles. I'm hoping I can run and not grow weary. And uh, so we started talking about this and the banter started going back and forth that, you know, we're going to be, I'm going to be 50. So next year I can play over 50s. So all you... Young whippersnappers in the team who are just coming through the, uh, just turning 45, they're graduating out of the over 40s, you'll be stuck there and we're already bantering about how great our over 50s team <coughs> is going to be. But while I'm talking about that, I all of a sudden have had this cloud starting to settle on me ever since I started that conversation because I'm, I'm going to turn 50 soon. Who's over 50 in this room right now? Put your hands up. Okay, so I've got something good to look forward to. That's awesome. Some of you I knew were over 50. Some of you I'm like, what? Shocked. But I'm going to turn 50. So it started me thinking, just this, it's like this cloud of thought has descended upon me. And, and here's what it basically has been saying to me. I have statistically probably got more days behind me than I do left in front of me. That's a weird thought. Theo, you're laughing. Don't laugh. You've definitely got more days. <laughs> Unless you break a world record. Anyone ever, ever, did you guys who are over 50, did you reach a point where you suddenly thought that or is it just, yeah, a couple of you did, a couple of you telling the truth, a couple of you can repent later, you can deal with that. But um, anyway, it's this, this amazing thought, I've got more days if statistics are correct and I mean, my, my goal is I'm planning on living to over 100, that's my goal, that's my declaration, I want to be around over 100, I want to preach a message on my 100th birthday, that's what I want to do. That's a goal of mine. I'm heading there. I'm, so far, I'm doing okay. Some of you may still be there. Exactly. That's right. I like that faith declaration, Debbie. Some of you may be there. Theo, you're going to be part of that great cloud of witnesses that's hanging over the balcony watching us. But I've got more days potentially behind me than I do in front of me. That's statistically. And so it's made me look at my life. It's made me look at not what's behind or what's in front, but it's made me look at what's in the right now. What's here in front of me right now? And I've had these words running around inside my head, and these are the words, if my time is not now, then when is it? If my time is not now, then when is it? And if my place is not here, then where is it? If, 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 if my time is not now, then when is it? And if my place is not here, then where is it? And it's made me think, am I the kind of person, and, and I want to ask you this question, are you the kind of person that is embracing what God is doing and the gifts and the call and the talents and the skills and the time and the energy and the finance and all the things that God has given to you, are you embracing them in the here and now or are you waiting for the there and then? Are we, are we living for God with everything in the here and now? Or are we waiting for the there and then? It's an interesting question because I've looked at myself every day since this cloud descended and I'm asking deeper questions of me. Am I living in the here and now? Or am I waiting for something else? I wonder how many people here, you're waiting for something else. 
So you're not really living in the here and now. You're living in the there and then. You're waiting for something else to happen before you embrace everything that God has to offer for you. The problem with that is that if I'm waiting for the then and there or for somewhere down the distant future, I'll guarantee this, I'll lay my head down tonight and realise I didn't embrace everything that God had for me today. In other words, the opportunity for today was a waste. Who likes wasting things? I don't like wasting things. Do you you like, who likes it when, I mean, everybody would know this when you've got kids especially, right? You just basically, it's just, there you go with the dollars, there you go, there you go. You just feel like you're just dishing it out. There you go. There you go. Mick's laughing because he knows it's true. There you go. There you go. And, and we feel that way sometimes about money, the bills, and it just it comes in. I mean, you work so hard, seven days, slaving, sweating, bruises, cuts, whatever it is that you do, and then you get that thing and it goes at electronic deposit. Boom, all of a sudden, your bank balance goes from nothing to bang, 100 or 200 or 1,000. And then it just automatically, as quick, goes bang, out goes the phone, out goes, and it just dwindles back down. We don't like to waste money. I want you to imagine, though, if you could carry time in your wallet. Imagine if you could carry your time in your wallet and you could tangibly see it. How would you feel going, there you go, there you go, there you go, there you go, with your time? I wonder how we would think about time. I wonder how we would think about the opportunities that present. I wonder how we would think about today. I wonder how we would think about this exact moment right now. In Esther chapter 4, verse 14, we all know this story. Esther is a Jew who ends up through a long series of events in the court of the king. And this particular king is about to enact a decree that will kill all the Jewish people, one of which is Esther. And so her uncle comes to her and her uncle gives her some advice. And this is what he says. He says to Esther, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. In other words, staying silent was an option. It's an option. She could stay silent. It's an option to not say nothing. It's a valid option. It's not the only option, but it's an option. And he's saying, you can take that option. The decision is going to be your decision. You can take this option if you want to. And here's the thing. If you take that option, deliverance for these, this group of people, deliverance and relief will come to these people but it'll come via another channel. So it's not like God's going, if you don't, I'm all discombobulated and I don't know what to do. He's going, here's an invitation. If you don't want to take it, I'll just offer it to someone else. Simple as that, I'll just take it from you and I'll go, oh, that's okay, I still love you, but I'll offer it over here. Relief and deliverance will come to these people through somebody. Relief and deliverance will come to the people of Lismore, Ganelabar, Australia, India, China, Africa. Relief and deliverance will come. But will it come through you? Will you play a role in the big picture agenda that God has? Because I'm giving you an invitation. I'm offering you a spot on the team. You don't have to take it. But it's going to happen anyway. Years ago, I was in Sydney with a, a couple of mates of mine a long time back. I'm a, a West Tigers supporter. Any West Tigers fans here? There's got to be at least one. Yep, beautiful. Okay, yep. Anybody else? Anybody else? Daniel, anyone else? No, that's right. You're a dragon, aren't you? Sorry, my bad. Shouldn't have brought that up. Okay, so for years ago, me and my mates went down to Sydney. We went to watch the West Tigers versus the Townsville um, Cowboys. Anyone, anyone into the Cowboys? Anyone support the Cowboys here? Good, good, you can all stay. And um, so we go down there, we, we fly down to Sydney and we go to Leichhardt Oval and the Tigers play. We get, we get there early Friday morning, it's a Friday night game, so Friday morning we go to the West Tigers Leagues Club. We go in there and of course there's a Hall of Fame for the Balmain Tigers and the Western Suburbs Magpies that merged. So we spend the whole morning walking around the Hall of Fame, reading the stories, looking at the photos. So the ladies behind the bar noticed us and they asked us where you're from. We told them we're from Ballin and we come all the way down here to watch the Tigers whip the Cowboys tonight. 
And so what they did is they said, oh, come over here, we unlock the pool table. This pool table is yours for the whole day. They unlocked the pool table. We got to play pool all day, free of charge. Uh, and they treated us really, really well. Anyway, after uh, it was getting ready to start the game, so we left and we did the long walk up the hill towards Leichhardt Oval and stopped on the way. Got a haircut. It was a really good haircut too, by the way. Anyway, we stopped and we walked up there, which is kind of a weird thing for three guys to do, to stop and have a haircut. And you know what else we did? We're so nice. Because she wanted to get to the game as well, we swept up the salon for her so she could go. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just thinking of that now, thinking, geez, we were nice guys. So anyway, so we got there to the football and we are watching the game and the Tigers absolutely tore them apart. It was like 50 to 4. Smashed them. And we had front row seats at Leichhardt. It's not like grandstands. They're, it's really close to the grounds and we're sitting right here and there's a cage there and there's Benji Marshall and all these boys sitting. We could reach out and touch them. End of the game... Don't you? Oh, me, you'll be gone. And so at the end of the game, we get up and we leave Leichhardt over. We walk back down the hill with a big, big train of Tigers fans to, the, to go back into the club. And there's a big lineup, and we're wanting to go back in. And, and when we get sort of about five or six people from the desk, one of the ladies behind the sign-in counter saw us, and she goes, you boys, come over here. Pulled us out of the line. Pulled us off to the side and said, do you want to go upstairs? And do you want to join the team for their after-game celebration? And we went, Yeah. So we got escorted upstairs, they opened the door, we go in there, Robbie Farrer is receiving his Player of the Match Award where we spent the whole night talking to Tim Sheens and having conversations with him and it was a fantastic night, I got a slew of photos and so on. But you know what, the point is this, we could have said, no, I don't need to go up there, I don't want to go up there, they were going to have their presentation anyway. It wasn't pivotal and revolving around whether we accepted the invitation because they had an agenda. And what we need to understand in life is God has an agenda. And it's not pivotal on whether you or I accept his invitation to join in. He's going to do what he's going to do. His story is his story and he's writing it. From Genesis to Revelation, he's writing it. But the beautiful thing is that he doesn't need us, but he wants us to participate. If he needed us, he'd be in all sorts of trouble. Amen? If God needed you, if God's eternal agenda rested on your obedience and your abilities and so on, how many of you think God would be in trouble? Three of you. I'm going to stand here and say he'd be in a lot of trouble. If God's agenda was dependent purely on me, God would be in a lot of trouble. But his agenda is not dependent upon me. He doesn't need me, but he wants me. He extends these beautiful invitations and says, I'm going to give you a chance to play a little bit of a role in bringing deliverance and relief to the people. And this is what Mordecai is saying. God will do it any way that he wants to. You don't have to say yes. Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but I want it to come from this place. How many of you would like to know that when you stand before the Lord one day, that he says to you, you know what, you played a role in bringing relief and deliverance to the people around you. Who would love that that, that acclamation from God? Or to put it this way, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Enter into your rest. You took what you had. You took the invitations, the opportunities, and you actually were one of those people that did something with this time that I gave you to build this thing called the kingdom of God. I want that testimony. I want that to be me, and I I pray that that's what all of you want. That's what we're singing about passion a second ago. You know how passionate you are about something. You've just got to sit back and look at your life. If I could shadow you for 24 hours, I could tell you where your passion was and you could do the same to me. And, 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 And it wouldn't matter what I say, you look at what I do. You look at where I put my time, my energy, you look at where I spend my money. Those things communicate where my passion is, this doesn't. I might tell you where I want you to think or where I wish it was, but you shadow me for a week and you'll see exactly where it is. Is my passion to be used of God and to get on board with his agenda to bring deliverance and relief to people. Here's what he's saying to Esther. Esther, could it be that you're in the right place at the right time? He says, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have Come to your royal position for such a time as this. Who knows that you haven't come to your royal position for such a time as this? In other words, who knows whether you're not in the right place 
at the right time. How many of you believe you're in the right place at the right time? Because whether you believe you're in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time, it'll have an impact on what you do and how you live. In particular, when it comes to the agenda of God. Are you in the right place at the right time or do you think that you're in the wrong place at the wrong time? See, people that think they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, what it does is it produces this real passive mentality about life. It produces a real passive mentality about what we do. As a matter of fact, thinking you're in the wrong place at the wrong time is, is a subtle, it's a subtly dangerous mentality because it produces passivity. But here's what happens with passivity. When we're, when we're passive in life, we're passive about the things of God. When we're passive about getting involved in God's agenda, here's what happens. We, 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 we're, we're kind of like a, a car that pulls up on the side of the road and we stop the engine and we sit there. And we feel okay because we're safe in the sense we're not actually driving backwards, so it's not too bad. But what's happening is God's history is still driving past you on the freeway. So while you're not moving backwards, God's still moving forwards. So really, we're still getting left behind. We're still getting left behind. If you think you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you will live a life of being constantly left behind. As you get older, one day you're going to sit there and you're going to look back on all these days. Some of you might be doing it now. And I wonder what you'll say to yourself about your life, particularly when it comes to giving some time and energy to God's agenda. I wonder what you'll think. Will you look back and go, I spent my whole life waiting for something, thinking I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And now here I am, and I realise that I never, ever landed in the right place at the right time. What's going on here? We're going to live with one of two mentalities, right place, right time, wrong place, wrong time. If I could write Esther 4.14 from the New Allen version, it would say this, Esther, you have an opportunity right here and right now to contribute to what God is wanting to do, but it's up to you. You have an opportunity right here, right now, to contribute to what God is wanting to do, but it's up to you. The choice is yours. Wrong time. People who live this way, they're always waiting for something else to happen before they decide to dip their toes in and join God on his plan to bring deliverance to other people. Wrong time time wrong time and look here, here are some here are some things that, that you may hear people say now I want you to understand something I'm not downplaying any of these things but I just want to make a statement about them in a second you know when work slows down when work slows down I'll put my hand up and I'll get involved and I'll join God's agenda and I'll do something that helps bring deliverance and when, when work slows down because work's just crazy but when it slows down how many of you know that work pretty much doesn't ever slow down Anyone there? When I just get through this, I, I cannot tell you the number of people I've spoken to. When I just get through this, I've been like that. When I just get through this situation, when I just get through that next meeting, when I just get through that. But you know what happens on the other side of that? There's another thing. There's another thing. And before you know it, my time is getting chewed up and eaten up and it's work, 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 because there's always something else. You know what's amazing? I've spoken to retirees, and maybe some of you retirees can tell me this. I've got friends who've said that they're busier in retirement than they are when they were working. Couldn't wait to stop working and retire so I can kick back. Now that I'm retired, I wish I could go back to work because it's so busy. Because it's so busy. When I just, when work slows down, maybe when the kids grow up, just when the kids grow up, I'll do something for you, Lord. When the kids grow up, I'll dip my toes in and I'll, I'll play a bit of a part. I, I get that. I've had small children, um, you know, and the small children grow up. But here's the bad news. They grow up, but they're still your children. They're still your children. They still want things from you. They don't just take up your time wiping nappies and, and, and cooking dinner and wiping dribble and giving them milk bottles. Now they're taking up your time with girlfriends or boyfriends or relational other issues or work-related stuff or sporting things. They're still, it's still there. It's still there. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. It just changes form. 
When I know a bit more, God, when I know a bit more, Lord, then I'll dip my toes in and I'll be somebody that brings deliverance and relief to people when I know a bit more, God. And so I just, I just need to read more books or maybe go to Bible college or I just need to get more. Theory. And I'm not against any of that stuff, but I'm just saying when you, people that think when I know a little more, guess what? You never know enough. You know what I've discovered about God? Every time he answers a question, there's five new questions I have no answer for. I feel like I'm getting dumber. The smarter I get, the dumber I feel. It's like the closer you get to eternity, the bigger eternity looks. And, and the closer you get to God, the more you realise, why am I trying to work you out? Every step that takes me closer takes me further away. Everything I thought would bring more clarity brings a little more confusion. And instead of asking one question, now I've got five. I'm going to stop with five because if I ask the five, I'll end up with 25. And I'm overwhelmed with five. So why don't I just do something now? Why don't I just dip my toes in the water and do something right now? When I have more money. When I have more money. You know, God, when I have more money, I'll dip my toes in, in, in the waters of your opportunity. When I have more money, God, I'll get involved in, 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 in doing things to bring deliverance and relief to people. You know, I, I, it's touchy always talking about money in church. So if you're a visitor here, I don't do this all the time. But you know what? I know this about giving and offering, tithing, you call it whatever you want. People that can't, Give God 10 bucks out of 100. We'll never give him 100 out of 1,000. Or 1,000 out of 10,000. We've just got to start somewhere. We've just got to make the decision. And we always need more. If you're anything like me, here's what happens. I mean, I come from a background of, of zero finance. If you went traced my family back, we were not well off. We, we, we had many, many unpaid bills floating out there in the universe that I'm afraid to say my name when I go into places just in case they can trace back my ancestry. And just chuck them all at me, right? You owe us about $7.3 million. Oh, sorry, let's say Kirchen. I meant Kitchen, Alan Kitchen. And I'm just hoping, crossing my fingers, Alan Kitchen doesn't owe money anyway. Now, we're fine. We're all good. But I'm saying that's my background. And then, of course, uh, 19 years of age, I joined this organisation called Youth with a Mission. Or as some people refer to them, Youth Without Any Money. And all of a sudden, I'm paying them to let me stay with them to go and do things under their banner. But you know what? Loved every minute of it. Did it for 12 years. So we weren't rolling in funds, you know? But you know what? Way back then, we learned that we just got to be generous and, and realise that I can take a little bit of my finance and I can contribute to what God is doing on planet Earth through my giving. It's a little piece of me that can help bring deliverance and relief to people. But if I don't start with nothing and I keep on thinking I need more, I need more, you'll never have enough. You'll never do it. Because it's a decision made internally, not something you look at a checkbook one day and go, oh, I've reached the point, I can do it now. We either want to get involved in, in God's agenda and help bring deliverance and relief to people through most of us, again, as, as believers, giving through. And if you don't come to this local body, let me encourage you, you should be uh, giving financially to your uh, local body that you go to, whatever gathering you come from. You should be contributing because you can't do everything by yourself, but when everybody puts a little bit in, we can do stuff. Amen? We can do things. When I get some spare time, who loves that one? When I get some spare time, I'm going to get involved in God's agenda to bring relief and deliverance to people. Who, who's ever said that when I get some spare time? What even in the world is spare time? What is spare time? Can anyone tell me what spare time is? Is there a mother here that can tell me what spare time is? You know why? Because we're that busy that we don't have spare time. We have awake time and sleeping time. We don't have spare time. We're running around. There's so many things to do. We've got no spare time. But when I've got some spare time? No, no, because what will happen is when you get a space in your time calendar, you know what you do? You just fill it with something else because that's the way life works. We'll keep you busy. We'll just give you something else now to put into that spot. Here's something else you need to do. Here's something else you should do. And, and it, it, there's no spare time. There's no spare time. In other words, there's no perfect environment. We talk about wrong place, wrong time. Wrong time, there's never, ever going to be a right time. You know, there's no better time. For you to decide, I'm going to be a part of bringing deliverance and relief to people. There's no better time to make that decision than right now. Right now, this moment here, you'll never get a time that's better than the moment in time you right have now. But if you keep living, instead of in the here and now, and you live in the there and then, you'll constantly be waiting for things to change. And you'll end up like me one day, you'll be 50, and you'll go, I've got less in front of me than I do behind me. And how much of what's behind me have I actually invested into God's agenda to bring relief and deliverance to people. I spent a lot of it playing sport. A lot of it watching TV, listening to music. A lot of it going out to parties. I spent a lot of it fishing. 
I spent a lot of it reading books. I spent a lot of it, spent a lot of it, spent a lot of it. How much was consciously spent bringing relief and deliverance to other people? Wrong time. Here's the thing. All these things can have an impact on what you might be able to do to make a difference. Everything I've just mentioned is valid. And all these things can have an impact on what you might be able to do to make a difference. But don't give them the power to determine whether you can do something to make a difference. They can, they, they can come into play when you're determining what you can do. But don't ever give them things the power to be the reasons why you can't do something. This is one of the great things about being involved in a local body of believers. And if you're not committed to a, what we call church, it's, I don't like using the term because church is the people, it's not the buildings. But if you're not committed to a body of believers, this is one of the reasons why you should be. Because your little bit that you have to give, finances, time, resource, energy, that little bit that you have to give. See, here's what God does. God takes your little bit and 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 God weaves them together and makes all our little bits into something big and significant. That's why I'm a firm believer. Firm believer. And I don't push it and I don't judge anyone that doesn't. But if you are involved in a local church, a local body of believers somewhere, there's always something you can contribute. Because your little bit God will weave it together and do something significant and big just by that little bit that you do. So don't ever let those excuses, those things become excuses to convince yourself, I can't do anything. We can all do something. And that's all God's looking for is that little crack, that little something, that little bit that we can contribute. There's a saying I read years ago and it went like this, the kingdom of God has often been referred to as a sporting event where 50,000 people who need some exercise are sitting in the stands watching 34 people who need no exercise running around. Are you the 34 running around or do you reckon you'd be the 50,000 sitting in the stands cheering them on? I hope and pray that we're the 34 people that we're running around. Wrong place. People who live this way never fully buy into where they are in the now. They never really buy into where they are now. People that think wrong time, they never buy into the moment. There's always something else to do. People who live with that mentality of wrong place, you never buy into where you are right now. Where you are right now. Here's, here's what I believe. If you're sitting in this building right now hearing me speak this morning, you're meant to be here and you're meant to be hearing it. I'm not saying you're meant to be here every week. Maybe you're passing through on holidays. Maybe you're checking us out. But I'm saying what I'm saying right now, I believe you're meant to be here right now in this moment hearing what's going on. There's something in this for you. But if you don't believe that, you can just easily hold it at arm's length. You go, well, it doesn't really matter to me because I'm still trying to find my place. Well, you can live that way. That's true. But people that live with the wrong place mentality, they don't dive into relationships yet because I, I could be gone. So I'm not really going to open myself up to anybody here. I'm not going to uh, invest in relationships. not going to get to know you too much. not going to let you get to know me because I'm just passing through because this is the wrong place. I'm not meant to be here. I won't offer to serve here, I won't do anything here well, because I'm just kind of passing through. It's not my place. I won't give here yet because it's not my place. Wrong place, wrong time. Let me ask you the question this morning. Are you living this moment today like you're in the right place at the right time? Or are you living every day like it's the wrong place and the wrong time? Which way are you living? You ever notice young people, young people today, they hate committing? Does anyone else notice this? Any parents in the room? If your kids are here, kid, can all the kids close their eyes so you don't see mum and dad raise their hand? You ever notice young people don't want to commit to anything? It's this culture these days of non-committal. Um, um, I've got children like this. They'll, they'll, okay, we're going to do this at a particular time. We're going to uh, uh, have dinner at five o'clock. Are you coming? And they don't want to commit just in case a better offer comes along. Anyone know people like that? You just can't get a commitment out of them anymore. It's like, no, it's not hard. Do you want to go to dinner? Yes or no? And they will just come up with a whole slew of really scientific head bobbling. And it's like, this is a simple one. It's a yes or a no. But they can't say yes or no just in case. You know why? Because they don't want to miss out on something better. Well, people who live like that, who don't want to miss out on something better, you'll never live like you're in the right place at the right time. You'll always think that you're wrong place, wrong time. So I'm holding out to something better. 
God wants us to live in the here and now. God gave us this moment. I don't know how many more of these moments I've got. Might not have tomorrow, might not have next week, might not have next year. I don't know what I've got, but what I do know is this. The moment I have right now is a gift from heaven. And it's not given to me just to spend on myself. It's given so that I can be a part of God's big story plan. Because planet Earth, here's the amazing thing, planet Earth will go on when I depart, and it started before I got here. So I'm probably not as pivotal as I think I am. I'm important to God. I'm important to God. But it's amazing what God achieved on planet Earth without me being present. Anyone feel that? Anyone notice that? How many of you know God did a few things when you weren't around? Anyone? Or was it just me? No? There's a dude called Noah built a boat and sailed it and I wasn't even around. I'm reading about this stuff going, really? I don't remember that. I wasn't there. There was a king called David, did all these amazing things. I wasn't around. God didn't ask me, didn't ask my opinion, didn't care, just did it. David said yes and God said okay. These 12 dudes, they walked around with Jesus, they did their stuff. I wasn't even there. Church started without me. How embarrassing. I thought it wouldn't stand without me, couldn't survive without me. It started without me. When I'm gone, it'll continue to go on without me. He doesn't need me. But he's extending invitations to me, and every day is an invitation. Would you like to be a part of bringing relief and deliverance to others? It's an invitation from heaven. It's an invitation from God. And here's the good news. If you feel like this morning you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, I want you to take heart because you're not alone. As a matter of fact, this collection of ancient documents is full of people who thought they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Gideon is standing in Judges chapter 6 in a wine press, which is a hole in the ground, threshing wheat. You know how you thresh wheat? You stand up high, you throw the wheat and, and, and stuff into the air, the wind blows away the old chaff, the good wheat falls down. Gideon's in a wine press. Why? Because Midianite, this other nation, were raiding the place and he was scared out of his wits. Wrong place, wrong time. God, how can your people be in this position? God comes along, God uses Gideon. There's a man who thought he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. God said, Gideon, you're actually in the right place at the right time. You're actually in the right place at the right time, Gideon. Joseph, Joseph gets thrown into a pit by his brothers. You know, he has this dream and goes up to him and with great wisdom. He says, I'm going to rule you guys one day. If you're a young child here, you never say that to your older siblings. It didn't go good for Joe. Then all of a sudden, Joseph finds himself in prison. Why? Because he's working in a guy's house and he's doing a great job. The woman makes a a, a pass at him. Joseph says, no, 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 I'm not married. You're married to my master. And uh, so she goes back and says, Joe took advantage of me. Next thing you know, Joseph's in prison. And Joseph's sitting there in prison. I've got no doubt he must have been thinking, wrong place, wrong time. What am I doing here? Next thing you know, saving his family and delivering an entire nation. If you think you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, Maybe you're not. Maybe you're in the right place at the right time. Maybe you've just got to get on board with God's agenda for now. Maybe you've just got to flick that switch and go, God, I'm not going to live anymore like I'm wrong place, wrong time. I'm just going to make the decision. Every day, every place, God, I'm in the right place at the right time and I'm going to live as if I'm in the right place at the right time. That's what I'm going to do. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, these three dudes. Everybody knows the song. We sing it. There's another in the fire. Three guys. Living in exile, in other words, they've been dragged out of their country, they're taken off to another country, they're in Babylon, they're under a, 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 another king, another whole way of life and so on. They don't end up bowing to that, giving into that culture. What ends up happening, they get marched towards a fiery furnace. I can imagine, wrong place, wrong time. Who wants to be in a fiery furnace? If I was standing in a fiery furnace, being pushed in there by the Babylonians, my first thought would be wrong place, wrong time. But all of a sudden, Jesus appears. Another one appears in the fire with him. What they thought was the wrong place, wrong time, I'll tell you what, if I could stand face to face with Jesus and not get burned, I'd love to go into that furnace. They didn't even know what was going to happen. So if you think you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you're not alone. But let me tell you something. Sometimes what you think is not right. And I want to declare this over you this year, 2021. Here's my mantra. This is going to be my mantra for 2021. This is my confession. I have reasons that may inhibit me, but no excuses that can stop me. I have reasons that can inhibit me from getting on board with God's agenda to bring relief and deliverance to the people around me. I have reasons that can inhibit me, but no excuses that can stop me. It's a decision that I have to make. And I'm going to make that decision. What could 2021 look like if you lived like you're in the right place at the right time every day? What could this year look like for you if you lived every day is if you're in the right place at the right time. What doors might God open up to you? 
Because you lived like you were in the right place at the right time. What contributions could you make to the kingdom? If you live 2021 like you were in the right place at the right time. What might you look like personally at the end of 2021? If you live every day like you're in the right place at the right time. Hey, what could our faith community look like? What could a rise look like if we all lived? As if we were in the right place at the right time for 2021. How many people could be set free if we all lived like we were in the right place at the right time for 2021? How many people could be healed if we live as if we were in the right place at the right time in 2021? How many families could be restored? How many people could be delivered? What could the name of Jesus look like in our community if we all said we're going to live like we're in the right place at the right time in 2021? Amen. Let me finish by saying this. I don't know everybody in this room. But 2,000 years ago, there was a guy who was definitely in the right place at the right time, and you might have heard his name. His name was Jesus. The story goes that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He was God in human flesh. See, man made a mistake. We were offered this beautiful existence by God, and we chose to do it our own way instead. We thought, we don't need the way you do it. We've got a better plan over here. And we all look at the world today. You can see how that ended up. It didn't end up too good for mankind, and we're still going downhill as a society very, very fast. God's got a dilemma. He's a just God. But he's also a merciful God. How do you uphold justice and mercy at the same time? Well, this is how he does it. He says, you deserve death. What I'm going to do is put on human skin and come down to earth and I'm going to die for you. Therefore, my justice has been satisfied because you can't get away with sin. It doesn't matter how good you are at it or how well you hide it. God sees it and you can't get away with it. So God says, I'll come to earth and here's what I'll do. I'll die for you. And in doing so, he appeases his justice. But at the same time, then he turns around to you and he says, if you'll accept what Jesus did for you, I can give you mercy. And I don't have to take it out on you. See, God came to give us life, not religion. He came to give us life. But we can't find life until we turn from what we're trying to build on our own. And we accept the life that Jesus came to offer us. We can't accept that life, can't have that life till we admit the fact that we've done the wrong thing. Each and every one of us have gone off on our own tangent. We've done our own thing. And there's a penalty to be paid for that. But thank God the story of Jesus is that God, because of his love for you, paid that price for you. What you need to do is choose to turn your life around and to accept him as the boss of your life. We hate that word, someone else being boss of our life. When I say boss of your life, he doesn't take the steering wheel like some people say. He becomes the GPS in the car and he tells you where to turn. you still got absolute control. He's not going to possess you like some. But every day you wake up and you make the decision, I'm going to walk with you, Lord. I'm going to walk with you, God. Everyone just close their eyes for one second. I'm only going to do this once. I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to ask you to come out the front. If you're here this morning and that's you and you have never given your life to Jesus, but you want to open up your heart to him, I want you to do a simple thing. It's an act of faith. It's got nothing to do with me and nobody else is looking at you. You just shoot your hand up in the air really quickly and then you pull it back down. It's just between you and God. I'm not going to call you up the front, nothing like that. If that's you, just put your hand in the air. Just let the Lord know. Say, God, that's me. That's me this morning. I need you in my life, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Well, Father, I want to thank you for this morning, God. I want to thank you for our time together, Lord. Thank you for, uh, Lord, an an exciting and hope-filled 2021. Lord, the possibilities are endless, especially when we connect ourselves up to a God that apparently can do beyond anything we can ask or possibly imagine. So, Father, as we continue this journey down 2021, Lord, I pray that each of us in this room, we would live every moment, not second-guessing, but with confidence that, Father, we're in the right place at the right time. You could, have, you could have had me born in 18th century China, but you didn't. You could have had me born in, 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 in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus himself, but you didn't. You put me here right now. And, Lord, I want to embrace that moment and embrace those opportunities. And God, work together with a community of people to make the name of Jesus great. So, Father, I just pray for everybody in this room. Lord, would you continue the work that you're doing in their life? Would you continue to stir them up with passion for you, God? Each of us, God, great passion for you. And, Father, in the next seven days when we leave this place, Lord, give everybody in this room, everybody that that calls upon the name of Jesus, everybody here that is walking with you, Lord, give every single one of us an opportunity in the next seven days to tell somebody how great you are and how much you love them, God. Somebody out there that up to this moment doesn't understand that and doesn't yet know it, God, give us the chance to tell them in the next seven days 
in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Bless you guys.